Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Freeman Spogli Institute Israel Studies Winter Quarter webinar series. My name is Amichai Magen. I am the visiting fellow in Israel Studies here at FSI. Together with Professor Larry Diamond, who is the William L. Clayton Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institution and the Mosbaha Senior Fellow in Global Democracy at FSI, we will be convening this new series of FSI webinars this winter quarter, exploring various aspects of contemporary Israeli politics, society, and security challenges. We open this webinar with an image of Awad Darausche, and we dedicate this webinar in his memory. On the morning of Saturday, October 7th, Awad, a 23-year-old Muslim Israeli paramedic and ambulance driver, was part of a three-ambulance team stationed at the Nova Music Festival near Kibbutz Re'im, approximately three miles from the Gaza-Israel border. The Nova Festival was a weekend-long outdoors trans music festival attended by some 3,000 revelers, many of them young people in their 20s, and Awad was there to protect them. At approximately 6.30 a.m., some 50 Hamas and Palestinian Islamic Jihad terrorists arrived at the scene in vans and started to spray the site with machine gun fire, and others arrived by motorized gliders. The festival became a scene of unbelievable horror and carnage. 364 civilians were murdered at the Nova Festival alone that morning, and many more wounded. Hamas and PIJ terrorists perpetrated mass rape at the festival and abducted at least 40 people, many of them young women, from the festival into Gaza. When the first shots were fired and the revelers began to flee in panic, Awad Darausche had a choice. He could have jumped into his ambulance and escaped the nightmare that was unfolding all around him. Instead, Awad chose to stay and help the wounded. His fellow paramedics begged him to leave, but Awad was resolute in his determination to provide aid to those in need. According to the testimony of his fellow paramedics who survived, his last words to them were, and I quote, I still have bandages in my hands. I will be all right. You go. Perhaps Awad believed that because he was Muslim and spoke native Arabic, he would be spared by Hamas. Tragically, he was not. The terrorists murdered Awad in his paramedic uniform, attending to the wounded, and stole his ambulance, driving it, most probably with abducted people inside, into Gaza. Indeed, on October 7th, Hamas killed dozens of Israeli Arabs and kidnapped five. Two of them, Bilal and Aisha Ziadne, were released as part of the hostage release deal with Hamas on November 24th. But three Israeli Arabs continued to be held as hostages for Hamas to bargain with. Awad Darausha was a hero. His tragic death is a terrible loss, not only to the Darausha family, but to Israeli society as a whole. Awad embodied the very best in the spirit of Israeliness itself, a shared Israeliness of Christians, Druze, Jews, and Muslims striving to build a shared society in Israel, despite all odds and all difficulties. And those odds and difficulties are formidable, as we will hear shortly. To explore the impact of Hamas's October 7th terrorist attack, on Israeli Arabs and the challenges of building a shared society in Israel at this incredibly difficult time for all Israelis, Larry and I are joined by Mohammed Darausha, Awad's cousin, and full disclosure, a dear friend of mine. Mohammed Darausha is the Director of Strategy at the Shared Society Center of the Givat Chaviva Educational Center in the Galilee. And he is a faculty member of the Shalom Hartman Institute in Jerusalem. He is widely consulted in Israel and abroad as a leading expert on Jewish-Arab relations. Mohammed previously served as the co-director of the Abraham Fund initiatives and as elections campaign manager for the Democratic Arab Party and later the United Arab List. He was the recipient of the Peacemakers Award 
from the Catholic Theological Union and was a leadership fellow at the New Israel Fund. In 2008, Mohammed Darawshe was elected as a city council member in his beautiful hometown of Iksal in Emek Israel, where we are both from, Mohammed and myself. And in 2009, he served as a member of the National Committee, which drafted Israel's coexistence education policy. Mohammed, in a moment, you will frame for us the topic of a uh, shared society in Israel, and you will offer us extensive public opinion data on Arab-Jewish relations in Israel in the shadow of the current war. But before that, firstly, we want to extend our deepest condolences to you, to your immediate family, to the extended Darausha family in Iksal and beyond. And we also want to begin by asking you what all Israelis are asking each other today. How are you? Kif Haluka. Mohammed, over, over to you. Thank you very much, Amichai. Uh, I feel like uh, most people here actually still in pain uh, without uh, closure of that pain uh, and not being able to get beyond it because every single day we see more casualties of this war that uh, is not ending and doesn't seem to be showing any indications of end. Uh, so it's like uh, having an open wound that uh, still continues to to burn. And uh, and at the same time, you, you're trying to protect the rest of the body from having any additional wounds. Uh, difficult period, difficult time. Uh, and especially for, for me as both being as an, Isra as an Israeli citizen, at the same time being Palestinian, where my country is fighting my people, this is not a comfortable time. To have your country fighting your people is a big challenge to uh, uh, your sanity, actually, uh, and especially knowing that uh, you cannot do much to stop it. Uh, we as uh, Palestinian Arab citizens of Israel, from one end, we want to be loyal citizens to the country, law obedient citizens to the country, but also loyal to our people and uh, hoping for the best for our Palestinian people. And uh, this time does not allow you to have uh, the ability to do the proper balancing between these two dual identities. Uh, it, brings it, it brings in a lot of frustration. It brings in a lot of uh, agony, a, a lot of despair sometimes. And uh, often uh, it's not just a zoom out, but the zoom in. Uh, other than uh, losing uh, our award, uh, I had uh, many friends that uh, lost their uh, first kins, uh, Jewish friends that lost their uh, children, uh, their sons and daughters, and also Palestinian uh, friends in Gaza that lost uh, their first kins, and some in some cases large families that uh, lost. Uh, uh, tens of members of the families uh, uh, during the uh, strikes on, on Gaza. So we're not healthy. Uh, I would say we're maybe we're fine physically, but not okay. Uh, and I would say probably will take a lot of time for healing from, from this condition when you don't know when the healing is actually going to even start. So that's even the short answer. Yeah. Your question of how are you? I share I share all of that with you, Muhammad. I sh I I think I think you've captured it um, beautifully uh, for 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 all of us. Just a, a time of tremendous anxiety and 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 pain on on both sides. Thank you. So, uh, if you allow me, in in the, in the next few minutes uh, that I will talk. Uh, I will start also by, you know, the big question is, uh, where were you on October 7th? Uh, I was asleep. It's Saturday, and we sleep in Saturday. Uh, and uh, 8.15, the phone rings, and uh, I, we got the notice that uh, our uh, award was uh, shot. We didn't know if he was, we didn't know if he was dead or alive, and that uncertainty uh, continued for six days until after DNA tests, we were able to verify his body 
and bring him in his final uh, trip uh, to his graveyard uh, with about uh, 60 ambulances uh, that accompanied him from the company that he worked in, a company called Ikhud Vat Salah. That's the company he, he accompanied. It was a mixed team of ambulance uh, drivers and paramedics. More than 100 of them uh, were in those uh, 60 ambulances. A parade uh, for a hero. Yes, for us, he was a hero. For the industry of paramedics and uh, ambulance drivers, he was a hero. Uh, for humanity, he was a hero. Uh, and on his grave, 20,000 people accompanied him. Uh, about 18,000 from the Palestinian Arab citizens of Israel and about 2,000 Israeli Jews from the uh, area, including many friends. On his grave, we had the Muslim ceremony and then we had uh, a Jewish Kaddish, a Jewish ceremony. Uh, I don't know many people that uh, have ever uh, got this honor and respect of having uh, two religions praying for their soul uh, as someone that uh, died as uh, as a saint, actually, he, he was selfless. He kept uh, he kept he stayed when he had the chance to to flee, uh, and uh, he said, "I speak." He said to his Jewish colleagues, "I speak Arabic. I think I'm going to manage. You go, you go, you flee for your life. I think I'll manage." And when they found his body, they did find the bandages in his hands, bandages that. He didn't have time to put on his uh, patients and that were right next to him. And he didn't also have the power to put them on his own wounds uh, that were that he incurred. Uh, like him, we had many stories of, of Arab citizens that tried on October 7th uh, to go in the war zone and to try to save their Jewish friends and Jewish uh, employers and their uh, Jewish suppliers of vegetables or suppliers of chicken. They went in and out with their trucks, one truckload after the other, until they themselves got shot. Uh, we have uh, tens of stories like that of Arab citizens that during uh, this crisis, they remembered mainly their humanity and not their ethnicity. They remembered their uh, co-citizens and co-countrymen and not their uh, political identity. Uh, and uh, they died as as, uh, as uh, people that proved that humanity prevails, and they allowed us to maintain some kind of belief that uh, maybe one day when this is over, we can come back to that starting point and, uh, and not uh, just keep accumulating uh, the hate and damage uh, to our humanity. Uh, in general, if I would move uh, on, I would just give you maybe zoom out a little bit about the Arab citizens in Israel. We're talking about a population that did not immigrate to Israel. Many, maybe on this in this uh, uh, chat will uh, or in this Zoom, uh, they would think about Arab citizens to Israel to the Jewish state. You know, they think of Israel as the state of the Jewish people, and they think that it was only started as a Jewish state. Actually, that's not the story. Uh, my family has lived in the same town for approximately 800 years. I'm 27th generation and my granddaughter is 29th generation. Uh, we're the indigenous population of this land. We are in our homeland and uh, uh, my grandfather's generation, uh, yes, did choose to surrender in 1948. And in exchange, they were granted citizenship uh, by the citizenship law of 1949. Then we were 164,000 people. Today, we are about 1.7 million citizens, but later on, uh, after the 1967 war, there was an added portion, which is East Jerusalemites, who became Israeli residents, but not citizens. So the citizens who are referred to as Arab Israelis or Palestinian citizens of Israel, there are different terminologies of how people define themselves. Actually, Professor Tamar Herman from uh, uh, Tel Aviv University finds 17 different uh, self-definition uh, combinations. Seven Ooh. of them are called singular identities, like only Arab, only Palestinian, only Israeli, only Christian, only Muslim, only Druze, or only Bedouin. So there are seven singular identities, but uh, all the singular identities together barely make 28% of the Arab population. And the rest of the population, almost 72%, have what we call hyphenated identities. 
they combine more than one identity. Among two thirds, uh, uh, they use the term Palestine in their self definition as Palestinian Israelis or Palestinian citizens of Israel or Palestinian Arabs or things like that. Uh, but also two thirds use the term Israel. And that became a stronger definition, especially after the Oslo agreements, uh, the Oslo agreements between Israel and the PLO. Uh, we're actually beginning to negotiate an end of conflict between Israel and the Palestinians. And uh, in most uh, wars around the world, uh, negotiations of peace agreements deal also, also with expats, you know, the, uh, the minorities of one nation that stay in, uh, beyond the borders of another country. But when Israel and the PLO were negotiating during Oslo in the early 90s, uh, neither the PLO, the Palestinian Liberation Organization, or the State of Israel, neither of them brought the case of the Arab citizens to the negotiations table. Uh, basically, it said to us, maybe you think you're part of the problem, but you're not part of the solution. The Israeli-Palestinian conflict does not offer a political framework for your status, uh, which basically started an interesting process uh, for Arab citizens, a process which uh, it was parallel process. One of it was speeding, speeded or, uh, Israelization process. You know, now that we know we're going to stay Israelis forever. So let's comprehend the fact that this is the country we live in. We need to make it our country. We need to live in Israel as Israeli citizens. And uh, that started two uh, uh, processes. One with a, which I call political, uh, uh, let's call it the vertical process of the political uh, uh, space in which we live, challenging the definition of Israel as only the Jewish state and demanding that Israel starts defining itself also as the state of its people and not just not, of its citizens, not just the state of the Jewish people, uh, basically widening the, the, the definition of the state uh, from just an ethnic uh, state into a civic state so that citizenship starts counting equal to ethnicity. Uh, and the uh, other uh, process was horizontal social economic uh, uh, integration, speeded integration. And uh, if I give you just some kind of uh, uh, indicators, uh, around then the percentage of Arab students in Israeli universities was about 3%. Today, it's almost 20%. Uh, more Arab citizens are going to Israeli universities to fit themselves to the Israeli job market, because we know this is the job market we are going to be integrating in. Uh, at the time, the percentage of Arab citizens in civil service, people working for the central government, was about 1.7%. Today, it's almost 13%. Uh, the medical staff, uh, then we were about 5% of the medical staff. Today, we are about 33% of the medical staff. We're 24% of the doctors. We are 38% of the dentists. We are 44% of the nurses and 55% of the pharmacists. Uh, going for, for jobs, basically what I call capacity building, uh, creating capacity that is most needed in the Israeli work job market. And the Israeli Jewish community created the space out of need. And you, when you had the need for the job and the need for the medical services, you got the win-win relationship. This process is happening also right now in the high-tech industry. Just seven years ago, we were 1% of the medical employees. Today, we are 7% of the medical employees, but we are 23% of the engineering students in, in uh, Israeli universities. So you see a revolution uh, just about to start in the, uh, in, in the high-tech industry. And if you go to uh, universities such as the Technion, which is our version of MIT, we are 28% of the students at the Technion in Israel. So there's a lot of fast speeding process in the Israelization, which is mostly social economic. Politically, I think we are more stuck right now than uh, moving forward, especially under uh, 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 the extreme right-wing governments, things become much more difficult. Since 2009, we experienced uh, 28 discriminatory laws that were passed by the Knesset under Benjamin Netanyahu's governments. Uh, the worst of them was the nation state law, which basically in simple English, it says is, the, the, Israel is the state of the Jewish people. 
and the state allows itself to be discriminatory in favor of the Jewish people. That's the worst law that was passed in the history of the country. It was passed on the 19th of July 2018 and is considered to be the most discriminatory law against Arab citizens. Politically, we have the right to vote to the Knesset. Uh, that's an equal right that we're not exercising as well, which means we have le less political power in the political scene because our turnout rate is much lower than the turnout of the Jewish population. Uh, we're also spread in three different political parties that one of them did not pass the threshold. So the representation in the Knesset now is only 10 seats out of uh, 120. That's uh, less than a half of our potential. Uh, but uh, there has been some kind of a glass ceiling. Sometimes it's home brought from home in which we do not want to be part of government. Sometimes it's imposed by the political parties, the Jewish political parties that do not want Allah to allow Arab political parties to engage in the decision making, in the executive decision making. So it's a complicated story, you know, well, that well, the political. Could I ask you to just uh, add another sentence about rates of political participation, um, just, just to give our audience uh, a sense? Uh, I think it's fair to say that when you compare Israel to other uh, democracies around the world, rates of political participation at the local and national level are relatively very high. We're talking about uh, a range of voter turnout in national elections at the national level that that extends that is typically in the low 70s and can also uh, uh, rise uh, to the mid and even 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 upper uh, 70s. It gets a little bit technical because at every given moment, about 10 percent of potential voters in Israel are outside of the country. And in Israel, you cannot vote from abroad unless you're a diplomat or something, something like that. Um, uh, but the Arab uh, rates of, of uh, uh, participation in national level voting, am I correct me if I'm wrong? They, they are significantly lower. They're in their they're in their fifties, if I if if I correct. remember correctly. Although oh. lo in, lo in local elections, they're, they're they're much higher. So maybe just just help us un understand that a little bit. Yes, in, in national elections, the turnout rate is about 50 percent, although in 1992 it was 78 percent. So there was a collapse, uh, a, or what I say, people voting with their feet, walking out of the political system, and that has a number of reasons. Uh, in the past, the biggest amount of votes were used to go to the national larger political parties, such as the Labour Party, which was getting the biggest chunk of Arab votes. And when the Labour Party was not delivering, people started moving out from there. They could not, they did not see the alternative Arab political parties as attractive enough or effective enough in the political scene because they are usually not integrated in, in, in government. So they are an expression of anger and frustration, but that's not translated into executive power uh, uh, where you can deliver a, a more chairs to classrooms or a better textbooks or better jobs or housing and things like that. So many people got a, a, a disenchanted and basically gave up on political participation over the last uh, a, two decades. Uh, we, we saw uh, in the last elections some kind of a little bit of rise, you know, jumping from 44% the previous elections to about 53% in the last elections. That's because of the entrance of a more practical Arab political party, which is called Ram, that spoke about wanting to be part of government. And actually, they were part of the previous government for the first time in history. And that created an ex expanded appetite for political participation in the Arab community. Uh, we also have the problem of being peripheral. And so usually in peripheral areas, less people tend to vote. In the local elections, municipal elections, the turnout rate is extremely high. It's up to almost 88%. So people know how to practice the game of going to the ballot uh, stations and vote, but they're choosing not to vote in national elections. Uh, if you allow me, I would want to share with, with you uh, another uh, thing, which is the new data uh, that brings us to today. A data that uh, we uh, of study that we did at my center at the uh, Givat Habiva uh, Center for Shared Society, and this data basically uh, tried to uh, examine uh, the attitudes of Jewish and Arab citizens uh, 
towards each other during this time. It's a difficult data. Usually we are in much better situation. Uh, and I'm going to share with you a few uh, uh, pieces of information that brings us up to date and quantify, let's call it the situation, quantify the problem in Jewish Arab relations. What we see here is that the majority of the Jews in Israel, 61% accept the definition of Israel as Jewish and democratic state. It means that 31 do not accept it. Those 31 want Israel to be defined only as Jewish. So yes, we still have a majority that see these two values as equal values, but the significant rise in the percentage of those that only want to, is to see Israel as only Jewish, uh, meaning that they delegitimize the status of Arab citizens as equal citizens. But 61% are still believing that this combination uh, can work. Among Arab citizens in Arab society, you see uh, actually a debate on this issue. 39% uh, accept the definition of Israel as uh, Jewish and democratic, and 39% do not accept that. Uh, one, in basically one refuses to accept uh, uh, the Jewish nature, and only 39% see that this, there's, this balance uh, can coexist. The next question we asked was uh, more about trust. Uh, usually trust of the Arab citizens towards the Jewish citizens and trust of the Jewish citizens towards Arab citizens is somewhere around 65 to 75 percent among Arabs and about 65 percent among Jews. During the time of war right now, this has dropped dramatically. Only 34 percent of the Jewish population trust Ooh. Arab citizens, mainly because most Arab citizens define themselves as Palestinians, and in the eyes of most Israeli Jews, Palestinians are the enemy. Uh, only 50%, dropping from 75% of Arab citizens, only 50% of Arab citizens now have trust towards Israeli Jewish population. This is the impact of a long war. Uh, almost one third of both populations has lost trust in the other just within a period of, of three months. That's mm. That's how dramatic the situation mm -hmm. is. On on the subject of uh, uh, you know we have we asked a, a question about uh, opinion uh, about about does the the government of Israel should the government invest in Arab citizens equal to that of Jewish citizens? Uh, that's what I call the horizontal issue. We spoke about the political. Well, now we're talking about the horizontal about government investment. Uh, you see that 42% of the Israeli Jewish population say no, they justify discrimination, and 42% say yes. So yeah, the Israeli Jewish population is split on this issue. Uh, the combination of 19 and 23, uh, which is a positive approach, uh, I'm sorry, the negative approach uh, that they, they justify discrimination is equivalent to the 42 on the left side, which say we need to maintain equality. Again, in the past, this was higher. During tens times, this, this even support for the social, economic integration and equality it drops uh, dr dramatically. Uh, now we see here a significant uh, majority uh, of how, basically the Israeli Jewish public and how they view Arab citizens. 56% of Israeli uh, Jewish citizens uh, see, uh, say that they uh, see uh, that Arab citizens define themselves as part of the Palestinian people, but prefer to integrate as equal citizens in Israel. This is quite a maturity in Israeli Jewish public that in the past used to even refuse uh, uh, accepting the Arab citizens defining themselves as Palestinians. Uh, and uh, this has moved uh, dramatically forward. Uh, forward. 23% also say that they see Arab citizens as defining themselves as Palestinians, but that actually uh, prevents them from getting integrated in, in the Israeli mainstream. So almost 23% see it as a problem, but 56% see it as a normal, acceptable uh, uh, terminology. Uh, I'm, I'm, jump, I'm not going to go through all of it. I'm, I, can, I will send it to you, Amichai. I'll send you the whole uh, uh, PowerPoint and you can share it with the participants just for the sake of time management. Uh, we went uh, into uh, current issues about uh, October uh, 7th events and how did they impact uh, uh, 
the attitudes of uh, Jews towards Arabs and Arabs towards uh, Jews. We see very dramatic uh, situation here, a combination of uh, almost 56% of Israeli Jewish uh, citizens see that uh, uh, their attitude towards Arab citizens is, is become worse. 37% uh, say it didn't change and only 4% say it become better. Despite the fact that Arab citizens are choosing not to be part of the war, not listening to the Hamas invitations to be part of the war and stage demonstrations or even engage in violence against Jews, but still 56% of the Israeli Jewish population uh, think that it changed their perspective and attitude towards Arab citizens to the negative and uh, that their relationship attitude has worsened. Among Arab citizens, 22%. Uh, significantly less uh, say that their attitude towards Jews uh, have changed towards uh, the worse. Uh, it's typical, by the way, uh, that minority is more moderate in its approach towards the, towards the majority because it's more dependent on the majority uh, and the, their, their positions are less radical in their perspective. In the Jewish community, the, the sense, and you'll see it later, the sense of fear and mistrust is reflecting itself in uh, in this. We asked, did the uh, events of October 7th impact or not impact your frequency of visits uh, to the other side? You see that 50% of the Jewish public said, this is not even a relevant question. They did not used to go to visit Arab towns before, and it's not changing their perspective. 31% said, yes, it, it is uh, decreasing uh, the frequency of their visit, uh, visits to Arab towns and villages. Uh, that's a similar number to the Arab community, uh, which is about 34%, uh, but 38% uh, of Arab citizens say didn't actually change, uh, mostly because of employment. Many Arab citizens work in Jewish towns and villages, and they can, cannot actually avoid having to work in Jewish towns. Uh, the Arab population produces only 11% of the jobs in Israel, although if, including East Jerusalem, we're 21% of the population, but we have a weaker economy. And as such, we have, we're very dependent on employment in the Jewish side. Uh, running through this a bit more quicker, uh, I'll skip this one. This one is a, a, is very, a difficult one, actually. We asked, in your opinion, over time, Will manifestation of violence uh, by Arab citizens of Israel towards Jews uh, strengthen or weaken? Uh, people are not hopeful. 81% of Israeli Jewish public say that uh, violence will increase, and 70% of Arab citizens are not confident that uh, we will uh, manage to overcome this crisis without violence despite the fact that we've been able to maintain it for more than three and a half months, but there's a lot of fear. This is this basically says great fear is hidden in, uh, in both uh, communities. Uh, I'm going to skip this also. Okay, here, this is an interesting piece of data. Uh, basically, the, the fact that there are no clashes, what do you attribute that to? 50% of the Israeli Jewish public say it's because of concerns of the Arab citizens basically fearing the police response. They think that the Arab citizens are not going out to the streets because they're afraid. While if you combine the two middle red lines, you see that almost 55% of Arab citizens say it's because of their desire to live in peace with Israeli Jews and because of feeling of shared destiny with Jewish citizens. Uh, the majority of the Jewish population see that the negative side but still you have 33% of the Jewish population that asserts the good intentions of the Arab citizens uh, at this time. Now, when we were trying to identify the areas of interaction that were positive or negative, uh, we were finding that uh, the key areas uh, where Jewish and Arab citizens are maintaining a good potential for uh, healing quickly from uh, negativity is in the workplace and in, this, in the universities. Uh, in other areas, such as in uh, youth activities, personal friendships, the matter of personal trust is 
preventing people to want to engage, but it's not preventing people from want to continue to work together. To continue to work together seems to be a little bit of safe havens, despite the fact that they are being challenged today. Uh, with phenomena of expulsion of Arab students from universities, expulsion of Arab employees from workplaces, avoiding going to work at, at each other's town or so on. But still, these are what we call islands of success, two islands of success that have maintained relations between the communities and have not collapsed uh, uh, completely. Uh, about mutual concern, we see that there is still uh, a lot of mutual concern uh, about working with each other, but still not throwing it completely away. Uh, we The question about the previous government is, is the potential that of a joint Jewish-Arab political uh, coalition possible. Uh, we see that 62% of the Israeli Jewish public do not support include in the inclusion of an Arab political party in the future government. This is down from 49% of the Jewish public supporting this in, in, in May, it was 49 versus 49. There was a tie in the Jewish public on this idea. Uh, today, it's 30 versus 62. Uh, we're losing ground for the idea of political participation in, in government for Arab parties. Uh, and also the appetite of the Arab public has dropped. Uh, in May, uh, the Arab uh, interest of the Arab community in being part of the coalition was about 72%. Now it's down to 52%. So in general, uh, I would say that, you know, yes, these are very worrying. Uh, this is very worrying data. Uh, but for me, as me and my uh, colleagues uh, working in this field, uh, we're looking what what do we learn from this data? What we learn is that there are areas uh, where you are able to create interdependency uh, and uh, interests-based uh, relationships. These are relationships that can withstand very severe conflicts. Uh, Jewish Arab relations have moved, moved three phases. One phase we call it the coexistence phase, uh, in which we we use the social contact theory as the tool to engage in in in, in relations between the communities. Uh, basically, come and uh, eat hummus together and have. Uh, break down stereotypes and humanize the other. The problem with this uh, theory is that over time it does not really withstand the tensions and the conflicts because people have, we have a syndrome which we call the returning home syndrome and get people get sucked back to their stereotypical old thinking, which is easy to happen when you live separately and 92% of Arab and Jewish citizens live separately. And especially uh, when we live separately, in uh, uh, and, and go to school separately. Uh, only There are only eight schools in Israel that are mixed. The rest of the 5,000 schools in Israel are separate schools, and that's where it's easy for stereotypes to develop, especially when they are fed by the fear of security and the fear of, of, of political ide different identity. The second theory which we uh, often use is the theory of the narrative debate, basically to allow the elephant in the room, talk about the conflict, talk about the problems. This is a very enriching and very uh, uh, educating process. Uh, with time, we realize that uh, the maximum you can get out of uh, such a debate is agree to disagree. And sometimes it's counterproductive and can create actually more damage than good. So for now at Givat Chaviva, we're not bringing Jewish and Arab youth together. Usually we have 300 kids to meet every week. To do it today, basically, will be forcing uh, a narrative debate theory and identity debate theory, and a lot of disagreements will will come out. So we we focus most of our work in, on de-escalation in in what we call uninational, separate national groups, uh, where we try to make sure that things do not collapse and when we do not get close to violent interactions because then the healing capacity that they after will be much, much more uh, difficult. The third uh, uh, issue is uh, the third uh, strategy is working with the, uh, is the theory. I think it was developed in Stanford, which is called the superordinate goal theory, uh, which focuses on mutual interests, to focus on identifying mutual interests. We pair Jewish and Arab municipalities together, whether it is on an industrial zone, or a soccer field, or a sewage system, or a shared bus line, where it is mutually beneficial for both sides. 
uh, all of those types of relationships have withstood this conflict and this tension very well. Uh, we've been uh, placing Jewish teachers in Arab schools and Arab teachers in Jewish schools. I started this project in 2005 with six teachers. Today we have 2,500 cross-sector teachers. During the war, we only lost six teachers that, that felt that this is impossible to continue. But 2,494 2, teachers continue to do it and schools continue to have them. And they're able to contain also the differences. But this is what you can do when you're able to have mutual interests in the relationship. Uh, it's happening also in the uh, uh, medical field. In the medical field, all in, during crisis, the uh, percentage of Arab medical staff increases, actually, because many Jews go and get recruited to the military. Uh, they're drafted. Arab citizens are, do not serve in the military. And uh, the percentage of Arab medical staff has increased to 40% during the time of war. All of them are showing to their shifts. All of them are doing war, uh, their, their work as, as, uh, uh, as people that serve their profession. Uh, we had six cases in which uh, tension has resulted with a resignation of Arab citizens from the medical industry, but it's six out of probably 11,000. Uh, so you see that when you have mutual interests uh, developing, uh, you are able to overcome uh, the severe differences and you're able to continue uh, partnerships. Uh, and from experience, we know, and I will end with that, uh, from experience, we know that the problem in Jewish Arab relations in Israel usually explodes, tension explodes on the Palestinian issue. It happened after the second intifada in October 2000. Then this resulted with clashes with the police, leaving 13 Arab citizens uh, killed and the mutual boycott, which lasted for many, many years. Actually, there is an interesting article written by Professor Sami Smoha on this. He calls it the lost decade in Jewish Arab relations. And basically, he claims that it took 10 years to heal Jewish Arab relations after the October 2000 clashes. In May 21, we had an interesting new test. There was also a clash between Israel and uh, Hamas, in which there were clashes in some of the mixed towns uh, in, inside Israel. But the healing process was much, much faster. It took all, less than a year and a half uh, in our calculations to come back to normalcy and to come back to a, a normal relationship. So our healing capacity was much faster, mainly because there were no killings of by the police of Arab citizens. So we did not accumulate what we call bad blood. Uh, it was a period of a week where we had demonstrations, but people went onwards in, in their life. The third and the last uh, uh, sentence I will say is that this period right now, uh, we are managing uh, also to avoid clashes that uh, uh, some people inside Israel are trying to drag us into, uh, namely the Minister of Internal Security, uh, Itamar Ben-Gvir, who has been trying to drag the Arab community into this ki these kind of clashes. Luckily, the Arab community is not falling in his trap. And luckily also, we're hearing voices in the Jewish community that are trying to prevent him from doing that, starting from the state president who spoke in our conference uh, against such a thing, uh, Benny Gantz, who's the most popular political figure in Israel, who also has been trying to uh, be on, on the right side of the issue. Uh, but extremists are trying to derail us from, from this uh, uh, successful uh, uh, relationship, uh, which we know we have to protect. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Mohammed, for this absolutely masterful uh, overview and, and analysis. I'll hand it over to Professor Diamond, uh, and then we will we will have some Q and A. Uh, Larry. Well, <clears throat> uh, first of all, uh, Mohammed, thank you for this incredibly lucid uh, and um, I, I think, frankly, balanced and uh, deeply insightful. Um, presentation and thank you for your willingness to share the data. I see there's a lot of interest among <clears throat> our listeners in studying your slides more closely. Uh, it's hard to imagine that um, the downward spiral of relations between uh, Israeli Jews and Israeli Arabs will take a decisively better turn until the fighting is over in Gaza. War is not a propitious uh, 
circumstance for this, but um, if we can look a bit over the horizon to that and to a situation where the active fighting has stopped in this regard, and there's a new moment for trust building, uh, reconciliation, and maybe even creative steps to uh, go further than was previously gone <clears throat> toward the conscious integration of Israeli Arabs uh, more fully into Israeli society and toward, you know, peace building and trust building uh, within Israel, what practical steps and what policy steps do you think a future Israeli government and, um, you know, future Israeli NGOs and thought leaders could take that would knit this society together more strongly across this fault line? Well, two approach uh, policy. One is to eliminate structural discrimination, uh, which exists in the 28 laws I mentioned. Uh, most of the discrimination, though, is uh, more de facto and not de jure. It's uh, that the legal uh, structure is not the worst. Uh, still, it needs to be cleaned up. I think, you know, we need to have a clean, democratic, equal value, which actually is the promise of the Declaration of Independence. The, prom the promise of the Declaration of Independence was social and political equality. They didn't talk about hierarchy. That's the spirit of the founding fathers. They spoke about equality, and I think that the legal system has to provide that equality, and the laws in the Book of Laws of Israel have to guarantee what a promise that was given to my grandfather. So one of it is institutional. The, the other is what I, what I mentioned is more the de facto discriminatory uh, issues, uh, where the majority prefers people like them. You know, most people like the ones that come with the right accent and maybe served in the same military unit, maybe came became from the same uh, uh, neighborhood. And you see this impacting actually uh, certain industries. So for example, in the finance industry, that's the weakest industry in which we have integration. Uh, only 3% of the uh, finance industry. Why? Because this is there's a lot of nepotism in the finance industry. It's, you know, the rich families that hold that industry together, mostly for their own families and their friends and their alikes. Uh, and uh, even Jews from uh, the periphery or Jews from uh, of uh, a Sephardic background are having difficulty finding their way in, in that uh, uh, industry. Also in the high-tech industry, but the high-tech industry has gotten a problem where they don't have enough brain power in Israel. It's such a gro fast growing industry that they need to tap into the hidden brain power in Israel. Where is that hidden brain power? It's in the Haredi ultra-religious Jewish community, and it's in the Arab community. The Haredi ultra-religious community does not want to study math, and they basically say, count us out of that industry. The Arab community sees this as an opportunity and says, yes, we do want three times the average wage that this industry offers. Uh, and, uh, so, and that's why they're beginning to open up the, their doors the Arab community is building capacity, the Jewish community is building doors. So there's a bottom up and there's a top down approach. Now, civil society organizations uh, are focusing a great deal on the educational aspect. I think that the separate and segregated educational system is the mother of all evil. That's where stereotypes develop uh, uh, when you start hating the other, mainly because you don't know him. Uh, that's where you never even get a chance to Debate, you know, debate maybe is not a nice thing to do, uh, but at least you're able to bounce your ideas. Uh, you see that uh, most racist perspectives of Jews against Arabs and Arabs against Jews is in areas, in more remote areas, the pe where people do not have a chance to interact. In towns where people have a chance to interact, you, you see racism dropping dramatically. From our experience, also through our work, uh, we see that you know the average racism rate among Jewish and Arab high school kids against each other is somewhere around 60% in high school. But when they come to an institution like ours and they go through an educational process of getting to know the other, once they're out of the gate, three days later, the racism rate drops to around 12%. Uh, 
So there is a cure against fear, against racism, which is trying to bring people together. We know how to do it better today. We know that if you do three separate days of encounters, it's better than three consecutive days uh, because you allow you engage actually in a discussion with them and you allow things to sink in their mind and they have a dialogue with their community about these issues. It's the same principle of vaccination. You don't get the vaccination once, you get it over three doses so that your body knows how to manage it. Uh, we're, we're focusing a great deal on the mutual interests uh, issue right now, where we, we pair interests, as I mentioned, with municipalities uh, and in workplaces, uh, speeding the process of integration of Arab students into the job market so that they do not spend too much time without jobs accumulating poverty and accumulating frustration. And where you, when you're able to speed their entry into the job market, it speeds their socialization in the larger Israeli society, which challenges the Israeli uh, Jewish public sphere into with a, a significant presence of Arab middle class uh, that has also a buying power, that has also cultural consumption of uh, the same cultural consumption and uh, 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 product consumption of the Jewish population, which, and the Jewish population starts seeing them as equals, either as customers uh, or equal consumers. Uh, and you begin to see in the last two decades with the development of an Arab middle class, you begin to see uh, that many Jewish businesses in, uh, in large uh, uh, shopping centers are beginning to employ Arab employees because they started having Arab customers. Uh, so because they also want to attract the customers uh, who have the buying power. It's capacity building of the Arab community. It's space creation in the Jewish community. And some, you know, I, 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 although my center calls itself the Jewish Arab Center for Peace, I try to work on pieces of peace. You know, take it one piece at, at a time. You know, we're not going to bring the, the capital peace concept of the Middle East, but we're able to tackle a problem of how do you test Arab students to enter Israeli universities? So if you test them in Hebrew, they lose 23% of their grade. But if you test them in their mother language, they gain 15% of their grade, which qualifies many more to enter university. Those are the kind of issues that we tackle. Uh, to not to have exams for Muslim fasting students uh, during the month of Ramadan after 1 p.m. Because then their capacity to do well in exams is damaged by about 20%. So you pull the exams, you convince Israeli universities to have exams in the morning and not in the afternoon so that you can give the students the, the chance to get the best out of their brain and not uh, punish them for their cultural uh, uh, practices. So these are the kind of working solutions that we're looking for. I can't, I'm not sure we can call it peace, but it is definitely pieces of peace. So, uh, Sorry, um, th thank you, uh, Mohammed. I'm, I'm conscious of the fact that we have uh, a lot of uh, okay, questions. And so um, we have about 20 minutes for, for, for Q&A. Um, and uh, I'm going to uh, combine uh, questions uh, based on the, the, the various themes that they raise. As you can imagine, Mohammed, there's quite a lot of interest in the role and attitudes of Israeli Arabs, uh, Israeli Arab Palestinians, um, towards uh, the day after in, in Gaza and also towards the Palestinian population living in Judea, Samaria, uh, West Bank. And so let me read out a couple of questions and get your thoughts on that. Uh, Jeffrey Allen uh, asks, uh, Director Darausche, given your expertise in Jewish-Arab relations and in coexistence, what role do you believe Arab Israelis can play in helping to fashion governance model, a governance model for people in Gaza once hostilities have ended? How will those who seek to achieve this objective foster trust between these two communities? Uh, related to that, Naya Reed Yassin asks, do you anticipate a rift between Palestinian Israelis and Palestinians living in the West Bank 
after uh, the, the the war, after the conflict. So perhaps Mohammed, you could uh, you you could share your thoughts about about that, and then we'll move to a, a, another set of questions. Actually, these are two very good questions that I'm, I'm I'm personally very busy thinking about them. I'm not sure I can give a very coherent answer. Uh, you know, we're still we're still in 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 a process that you know the target keeps changing. So you need to try to keep following it. Uh, the Palestinian public in the West Bank and Gaza, I'm not sure what their perspective and vision about the day after. Uh, on uh, We know that uh, before October 6th, the belief in two-state solution uh, was dropping dramatically and the uh, aspirations for a one-state solution among Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza were rising, uh, mostly out of believing that you cannot accomplish the two-state solution. Uh, after President Biden brought back the, the idea of the two-state solution in his visit to Israel, this seems to become a, a much more uh, significant option today, uh, although uh, I can uh, refer to many difficulties in accomplishing that. You, in order to, do, to have that, you need to have both willing and capable leaderships in both Israel and Palestine. So maybe on the uh, Palestinian side, maybe Abu Mazen is very willing, but he's not capable to deliver the Palestinian people. And maybe uh, Netanyahu is very capable, but he's not willing to deliver peace. And, as, and that was the formula which allowed us to negotiate in, in, uh, during Oslo with uh, Arafat and uh, uh, Rabin. Uh, they were both willing and capable and uh, you know, we saw that uh, Rabin was assassinated, and since then we got we started the derailing from from the process uh, uh, afterwards. I, you know, I, the the Ar Palestinian Arab citizens of Israel, uh, uh, as I said, want to be also loyal to their Palestinian. In the past, Arab citizens were seen as traitors, as accepting Israeli citizenship. This was the case, as I said, until about the Oslo uh, agreements when the Palestinian leadership decided not to include us in the solution, and we were forced actually to seek our own destiny. But in seeking our, our own destiny, I think we developed uh, uh, two strategies. One is very strong support for the Palestinian people's quest for statehood and independence and end of occupation. And I think if you ask around the world, which is the largest group that supports the Palestinian, the two-state solution, I think you'll find that the Arab citizens in Israel have the strongest level of support for that. And mainly out of self-interest also. It's like a, a child living in a house where uh, parents keep uh, fighting. Our country is at war with our people, I said. We don't want our country to be at war with our people. So out of self-interest, we want a, an end of occupation and we don't think this relationship, as is today, uh, uh, with uh, with fighting all the time erupting, uh, and occupation, uh, which is in, which is oppression uh, against the Palestinian people, we don't want this to continue either. Uh, we want the dignity uh, for the Palestinian people and safety for the Palestinian people. But I think we also uh, understand the need uh, for the Israeli public to have their dignity and safety. And uh, we know that uh, to guarantee that, if we say to the Israeli Jewish public, they will probably uh, get upset us, at us uh, because they want us to uh, swear, swear loyalty and patriotism to Israeli society. And it's very difficult to swear loyalty. Uh, loyalty, it's easier. But patriotism, uh, when it, patriotism is against the Palestinians, uh, these days, it's very difficult to, and we pay price within the Israeli Jewish uh, society. And uh, towards the Palestinians, you know, towards the Palestinian people, it's it's also not a problem to have loyalty. Uh, but uh, when it comes to uh, acts such as the 7th of October, uh, we cannot uh, we cannot show any kind of uh, sympathy for such an act. Uh, 80 per 85 percent of Arab citizens oppose the attack of Hamas on uh, uh, October 7th. Two percent support it, and actually 70 percent say that uh, uh, the events of the of the war strengthened their Israeli identity more than before. So yes, it does create some kind of a discussion, dialogue, maybe debate with the Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza. Uh, 
more people are not afraid of having that debate, not afraid of creating that debate, uh, mainly because we see our destiny as future Israeli citizens and our concern about the relationship with Israeli Jewish fellow citizens is critical, but it doesn't come at the expense of uh, the deep, sincere uh, will to uh, that we want to see a future Palestinian independent state that guarantees the dignity and freedom of the Palestinian people to live in a state side by side with the state of Israel, not replacing the state of Israel. Mohammed, that data uh, among uh, Israeli Arabs and their attitudes towards the October 7th uh, terrorist attack, first of all, I think is very encouraging. And as you say, we see an unprecedented level uh, of a sense of attachment uh, among Israeli Arabs to uh, to their society, to their country, um, and and to their to their state, but that stands in very very sharp contrast um, to the figures that Halid Shikaki has uh, published recently about levels of support for the October seventh attack for Hamas uh, on display uh, among Palestinians in uh, in in the West West Bank. Uh, what do you make of? Uh, I think the figure is really staggering and very, very uh, worrisome uh, that 82% of people polled in the West Bank in the aftermath of the October 7th attack uh, supported the attack and and, uh, level of support for Hamas has actually risen after the October 7th attack. Levels of support for uh, Abu Mazen, for Mahmoud Abbas, for the Palestinian Authority is is worryingly low. how what, how do we make sense of uh, of that and then of the gap in public opinion between Israeli Arab citizens and Palestinians uh, living in the West Bank? How, how do you think about that? Well, I, I've I've seen some of the data from uh, uh, Dr. Shkaki. Uh, I think that the support there's increased support for Hamas, not necessarily support for the October seventh attack, which Hamas itself today says we didn't do all of the things that were done. So I think that there's some kind of a, a discrepancy in in these two perspectives. I don't. I doubt that most Palestinians support the attack on October seventh in the West Bank, but yes, there is an increased support for Hamas because of two things. One, they did bring the Palestinian state issue on the table. They managed to convince the Palestinians that uh, their strategy in, uh, in in the violent strategy and war forced President Biden and many countries in the West to now put back the Palestinian issue on the table. When uh, before October 7th, uh, there was zero political horizon for the Palestinians. Now there is maybe a narrow horizon, but at least there is a horizon. They think that this, this war will end with political diplomatic negotiations. I'm not sure if that actually will materialize, but the fact that this that this is on the table that attribute that to the capacity of Hamas to reshuffle the political scene. The other thing is that most of the uh, uh, Palestinians that were released in the uh, exchange uh, for the kidnappees, the Israeli kidnappees, most of the Palestinians prisoners released are from the West Bank, uh, which gave uh, basically a, a the Palestinians in the West Bank, the feeling that they are being rewarded. They are the first ones to get the rewards of the Hamas strategy, not Palestinians from Gaza that were released. Israel did not release Palestinians from Gaza, it released Palestinian prisoners from the West Bank. And uh, the third reason is the feeling among Palestinians in the West Bank that uh, Israel does not know limits. Uh, with its war against the Palestinians. It's, uh, it's, it's uh, uh, military effort is, uh, is beyond uh, reasonable. Uh, and uh, the fact that there were many Palestinian civilians killed in uh, out of the 26,000 Palestinians killed is very painful for, uh, for the Palestinians. I think it's very painful for the Palestinian citizens of Israel also. But in the West Bank, they probably have a, a different way to express their feelings. The Arab community in Israel is much more moderate in the way it expresses its feelings. Uh, in the West Bank, you know, remember that the more than 400 people were killed also in the last three months by the Israeli military. So they're feeling the harsh 
uh, uh, arm of the Israeli military, uh, and they're developing a lot of antagonism uh, against that. This is not happening uh, uh, among Arab citizens. We're not experiencing violence. If we will be experiencing violence, I think you'll get more radical perspectives representing, represented also among Arab citizens. Thank you, Mohammed. Another set of questions has to do with the Abraham Accords and the process of um, normalization. Uh, frankly, the, the, the warm peace that uh, was developing between Israel and the UAE, uh, Morocco, uh, Bahrain, etc., and the prospect of normalization of relations between Saudi Arabia and, uh, and Israel. Could you share with us uh, whether how that dynamic of, of normalization, uh, which um, on the one hand you said, and I think this is a matter for, for debate and that we should, we should have a, a future conversation about, uh, but uh, would arguably be seen as a sort of a sidelining or an, ice, or an attempt to sort of isolate uh, the Palestinian uh, uh, question from this broader uh, process of regional uh, development, but on the other hand, opened and would have continued to open uh, incredible opportunities for, for, for Israeli Arabs uh, who speak the language, know the culture, would have been in a, in a really unique uh, position to capitalize on normalization of relations with, with Saudi at a whole variety of levels. So how do Israeli Arabs think about uh, the, 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 the prospects of normalization, uh, both for themselves, but also possibly as a regional framework that would allow us to make meaningful progress uh, towards uh, Israeli-Palestinian uh, peace? I mean, the assumption that peace with Arab countries will bring us closer to peace with the Palestinians was behind uh, the agreement between Israel and Egypt way back in the 70s. Uh, so it's, this argument has been around for almost 50 years. Uh, the similar assumption also developed when uh, uh, Jordan also made peace uh, with Israel. Uh, the, in the peace with Egypt, the Arab citizens did not benefit a thing. Uh, actually, till today, uh, Egyptian universities do not allow Arab citizens to study in Egyptian universities. Uh, they see us as uh, uh, Israelis, and they are, it, it's more peace with the elite and not peace with the people. While with Jordan, it's a different story. Uh, Arab citizens have benefited a great deal from the peace with Jordan. Uh, almost at, there was a point in which almost a third of our student population was studying in Jordanian universities. That was part of the capacity building. When we had problems in Israeli universities, we sought solutions in Jordanian universities. Mm -hmm. Almost half of the medical Arab staff in Israel studied abroad, mostly in Jordan, and that's where they got the capacity. So we got a lot of wonderful opportunities, which we translated into better status in Israeli society and in Israeli economy. Uh, there was a hope that, uh, uh, you know, there is a hope that more relations with Arab countries will give us better opportunities. Uh, but at the same time, the realization among Arab citizens is that you cannot bypass the Palestinian issue. If you bypass the Palestinian issue, it will explode in your face. And I think that, you know, I don't need to say I rest my case. Uh, I think also uh, uh, the realization that economic peace is the guarantee for calming down, whether it is economic peace with Hamas, you give them X million dollars a year, money through Qatar to through Israel from Qatar, that economic peace is the solution, that strategy also collapsed. Uh, so now we have two strategies collapsed, uh, bypassing and going to regional peace and economic peace also collapsed uh, dramatically. Uh, the third theory could that collapsed, they called it mourning the grass. It's like you can have a, a, a small enemies here and there, you know, uh, you keep Hamas uh, as an enemy, but in some kind of control because you, you mourn the grass, you cut, their capacity slowly. What's happening is that you don't know how deep the roots are. Uh, you can cut the, the, the top of the grass, but you're not cutting the roots of it. And if you keep uh, uh, enemies uh, well nurtured for a long time, it will explode in your face. Uh, 
which brings me back to, to the perspective that we, uh, the Arab citizens are not opposing to the regional peace uh, and are part of the normalization in the, with the regional peace. I, I personally was in the Emirates and uh, may, I know of many friends that are doing business with the Emirates and with Jordan. Uh, for us, this is not normalizing from polit for political reasons. For us, this is cultural expand extension. You know, for us, the Emirates is a cultural extension for us. For us, Jordan is a cultural extension for our identity. When when I with my wife, we went to the Emirates. We went for cultural shows. We went for plays. We went for theater, and not just to do shopping in the shopping malls as the rest of the Israeli Jews do. When we go to Jordan, we go for cultural consumption. It's part of our larger Arab identity, which in which we feel at home. So for us, this is the absolute normal normalization. Uh, and we do not give it the Israeli, Israeli Jewish uh, or Israeli Jewish uh, angle. We have a different angle to it. You see many Arab citizens in the, uh, you know, in America, you have the, uh, the music shows where you uh, look for the American Idol. Uh, we participate in the Arab Idol although we have Israeli citizenship, but we are part of the Arab idol because that's the music we are part of. Uh, that's the culture we are part of. So that, that relationship with Arab countries allows us to go back culturally to the, uh, 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 to the bigger, to the hug of the Arab world, which we feel we are part of. You know, we are Israeli citizens, that's our political reality, but culturally we are part of, of the Arab regional okay. culture, which we want, uh, we aspire uh, to re-engage with it significantly. By the way, we we run our, one of some of our musicians run for the Arab idol, but they also run for the Israeli idol. Not yeah. the same individual, but running in the two contests. You know, the and two it, contests. anybody who knows Israeli popular culture and popular music will know that you cannot imagine Israeli popular culture without without Israeli Arab uh, artists and singers. Never mind our, our our football, our soccer, what Americans call the soccer league. Uh, over thirty percent of professional players in the Israeli uh, soccer league are uh, Israeli, Israeli Arabs. Um, uh, Mohammed, we could we could go on for a long time, and again, I want this to be to be the beginning of of our conversation because there's so much to uh, uh, unravel here and 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 to think about. But I, I want to uh, end with two difficult questions um, that um, have been posted, one by Antonia Four and one by Louis Bexler. And I think in some respects, they are sort of mirror images uh, of one another. We, we, we've kept the sort of the difficult to last, but I think we would be remiss if we didn't uh, put these uh, before you um, in, in concluding uh, this part of our uh, conversation. So I'm reading out Antonia, uh, Four's uh, question. Uh, Mr. Darausche, Israel is often labeled as an apartheid state. What is your view? What is the difference between South Africa's history of apartheid and Israel being accused of this label today? Louis Wexler asks, if a Palestinian state was created as part of a two-state solution, how will Arab Israelis respond? To which state would they see themselves uh, aligned? So two, two, two uh, questions that we can spend a lot of time on. Uh, uh, we want your want your views, and then uh, we will uh, wrap up the uh, the webinar. For the first one regarding apartheid, you know, I I think that uh, uh, first of all, I think that occupation is worse than apartheid. So, if we look only at Israel itself, we can't refer to it as an apartheid. Uh, and just compare the legal structure. The legal structure in South Africa was formally, constitutionally, hierarchic legal structure. In Israel, it does not, it's not like that. In Israel, it's, you need to fulfill the promise of the uh, uh, declaration of independence to solve the problems. In South Africa, you needed to change the declaration of independence. And it's a different case. Here, the problem in Israel is failure in meeting the goal, while in South Africa, it was actually meeting the goal. The goal here is to reach social and economic equality, social and uh, political equality. That's the declaration of independence. In the process, sometimes we get derailed with this law or with this practice, but the goal 
which the majority of the population still subscribes to, is social and political equality. I believe that we will accomplish that. I don't think we are there. We have discriminatory issues, which I presented. We are battling with them on the ground. That's why I do not also subscribe to uh, the concept of, uh, uh, you know, uh, what do you call it? Uh, I forgot the English word. But you know, the, uh, say it, Muhammad, say it, say it in Hebrew, and we'll translate. Ahrama. Uh, oh, like BDS boycott. Like you know, yeah, I don't subscribe to BDS. My yeah, challenge, yeah. for example, to Israeli universities is actually to have more Arab students in, to have more scholarships in, to have more professors in, and not to pull out. I cannot pull out and simply become a marginal society. So it's a different strategy than the rest of how people see uh, see it. And, I, and, and we are scoring points. We know we're not winning the battle for absolute equality and democracy, but we are winning in points. Slow process to my taste, it's too slow, but it's better than just cursing the darkness. That's my approach to the matter. Uh, whether a Palestinian state, hopefully, when a Palestinian state will be established and I will do my, my utmost effort, legal effort to, to get to that, uh, what will uh, the Arab citizens, the Palestinian Arab citizens do? We will stay home uh, for one simple reason. We are home. We are in our homeland. And what we want to convince Israel is to act as our state as well. Uh, Israel knows how to behave to be the state of the Jewish people and be the defender of the homeland of the Jewish people. It does not know how to behave fully to be the state of the Israelis. Uh, that's my battle. My battle is not to run away and escape to live in a Palestinian state. Oh, would, you, where maybe... would, you want, would you want the uh, future Palestinian state to extend uh, equal rights to, to Jews uh, who would live in that Palestinian state? That's a question that was, uh, that was posted uh, in, in our Q&A. Absolutely. I, I, I think that the future Palestinian state needs to be a democratic liberal state. If it's not, I don't think it has the right to exist as a state. And that's the case, in my view, to every state in the world. You need to give people equal democratic rights as equal human beings. And if Jews go there and respect the laws and respect uh, 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 the right of the Palestinians also to define the Palestinian state as the homeland of the Palestinian people, which I respect Israel as being the homeland of the Jewish people, but not only. Israel is the homeland of the Jewish people and its citizens. Palestine needs to be the homeland of its people and its citizens, the Palestinian people and its citizens. I think that equal, equality, the civic equality, needs to be uh, respected on both sides. Now, for me, as I said, I'm not looking to move. I, in my, behind my house, there's the graveyard in which 26 generations of my family are buried. This is home. This is homeland. And my job is to make it my country and to, uh, and to make it mature to become a more democratic, more inclusive, more just, more equal. Uh, we're in better conditions today than 20 years ago, and I think we'll be in a better condition 20 years from now than where we are today. Mohammed Darausche, the Director of Strategy at the Shared Society Center of the Givat Haviva Educational Center in the Galilee and a faculty member of the Shalom Hartman Institute in Jerusalem. Thank you uh, so much for that. From the Freeman Spogli Institute at Stanford, thank you and goodbye.